Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is our number eight. This is exciting because now we're getting into the really juicy stuff. Just a reminder, you need to log in. And if you don't have your own, you can request one from the esriurl.com slash mapping hour page. Yesterday, we got into powers of working inside an organization in ArcGIS Online. After the geocoding and the time-based data, we got into publishing, and that's a real power that you only have access to with a certain login inside of an organization. You don't have access to that if you're just at user level, so you need to make sure that you're at publisher level to be able to have that. People who are working without being logged in to RGS Online don't get to see that. So this RGS Online organization with having the right role in place to be able to do some of these powerful things is really exciting. And we get to go into that today with the Living Atlas of the World. Joseph, in a few minutes, is going to be opening your eyes into that and then showing you a place where you can go on the training site we're going to be working with this concept of Esri access in order to be able to get into some of that content. You'll see subscriber content, premium content, and uh, getting access to the learn site. This is, we're getting into the really juicy content of ArcGIS Online. It's the exciting part of the, Joseph's going to take you to it. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing and Joseph, take control here. Indeed. Thank you for the great lead in there, Charlie. I agree with you. This is this is some of the very favorite things that we have inside this web GIS platform, and that is this living atlas of the world. So we're going to talk about what it is, how you can use it, and then actually get into it a little bit with the portal that is the living atlas, and then my colleagues are going to get you into it in a deeper way. Right now, let's go ahead and talk about, okay, why do we teach with the Living Atlas of the World? Well, I, I think there's a couple main reasons. First of all, as you know, throughout the mapping hour, we are talking about two things, teaching with GIS, so teaching GIS in geography or environmental studies or history or mathematics. So you're accessing a wide variety of content, different themes, different scales for different subjects. And then through the use of the Living Atlas, you're also teaching some GIS. You're teaching some skills with looking at different kinds of maps and apps and layers and permissions and all that stuff that goes into teaching with a meaningful technology such as geotechnologies. And really when it comes down to the fundamentals, folks, data, right, is the fuel for GIS. Some of you remember the old clunky days of GIS where you've got a white screen and you had to basically populate it all. Well, those days are gone. The Living Atlas is your key, your ticket to the world, really, is what it is. And we have a, we have a very exciting planet, don't we? We can look at things, as you saw with, with Tom in a previous mapping hour, animation. So we can look at changes over space and changes over time. And the Living Atlas allows us to do that. Now, the Living Atlas is a collection of, as you can see here, imagery, maps, etc. Now, what it comes down to, if you don't take anything away from my segment except for the following, this is the key kernel, um, and that is you've got a need to teach about watersheds with current stream gauging station data. In other words, what is the river doing down the road from my school right now? You pull up the rivers and the, and the stream gauging stations from the Living Atlas, done. You've got your content right there, and you can teach from that. So. Think of this as your living, interactive set of content. And there's no shortage of content. Indeed, the living atlas implies that it is living. It is curated. Now, I used to work at numerous federal agencies actually creating these kinds of data sets, Census Bureau, USGS, and NOAA. And those agencies, as well as many others, international on down to your local government, actually contribute data on an ongoing basis to the living atlas. So it is a curated living atlas. A couple of the main topics that are in the living atlas you can see right here. And that's why it's it touches so many disciplines. And so we and you in education are attracted to it because of its rich and deep content. And as my colleagues have indicated in past mapping hour episodes, you've got 
since we've got this WebGIS infrastructure or architecture at our fingertips now, you've got these live feeds, stream gauges I already mentioned, earthquakes you've seen, traffic information, weather, etc., are in there. So again, I, I wish we could get excited about this, Charlie. This is amazing. Uh, just a couple of topics to, to mention here. Weather and climate, many of you teach those topics. No shortage of local to global weather and climate information, as well as models. I'll get into that in a minute. But some of these layers in the Living Atlas are created to support major scientific endeavors and initiatives. Landscape, what's not to love? Agriculture, land use, land cover, that's all in there. Oceans, you know, in the not too distant past, we would look at land and then the oceans would be a gray or a blue, and we didn't have rich content for the oceans. One of the things that uh, I won't have time to get into in too much detail, but the ecological marine units that I refer to there, it's a 10 kilometer spacing all the way down the column from the surface on down to the ocean floor. The salinity, the dissolved oxygen, the temperature, Amazing resource. You could teach about lots of different things from ocean currents to climate uh, to much more. Now, not getting into it too deeply right here, but there are some different content types in the Living Atlas. Uh, for example, there are fr there's free content. So you can just, without logging in, remember there's a whole body of things that you can do inside ArcGIS Online without actually signing in or logging in. And that's important, right? Because the bell's ringing in five minutes, you've got to pull up something quickly and, and online or face to face with your students or your kids and show them. Okay, so there's there's a body, there's a section of the Living Atlas that's that's free, can use be, be used by anyone. There's also something called subscriber content, and you'll see this in a minute when I do some demos. It's part, provided as part of your organizational subscription. It doesn't consume credits, remember our credits discussion. So you and your students have to sign into your ArcGIS online organization in order to use that imagery, landscapes, historical maps, etc. And then there's premium content. It's a kind of subscriber content, so it's sort of a subset of two, but it does consume credits. Again, don't get too worried about credits, but just be aware that, that it does consume credits. And these are things like geo-enrichment. Ooh, I want to be able to tap in some, some uh, census data from, from the Living Atlas and pull it into my, to my map. And the privileges to use the premium content are managed by your organization's administrator. I mentioned some major science initiatives, for example, the map of biodiversity importance is the MOBI one that I have there, half Earth from E.O. Wilson, some of you may be aware of that, uh, to, to protect half of the world's land and ocean as a way of protecting the species in it, in them. So major scientific initiatives are supported by the Living Atlas content. All right, let's get into some hands-on demos now. First of all, Living Atlas is available as, as a web page, okay? So you can go into Living Atlas. We'll have this as a resource in the URLs to this episode. But I would start here, and my section is really about how do you use it inside this web page? And my colleagues are gonna get into, oh, I'm inside ArcGIS Online. How do I pull data down from the Living Atlas or really stream it down? But uh, my section is going to concentrate on, okay, how do I use it just right here inside livingatlas.arcgis.com? All right, how do we do that? Living Atlas is the page, and one level up from that page, and we'll also have this resource, is remember how Kylie and some of my other colleagues were talking about, pay attention to the data, where it comes from. Don't just pull data down just because it looks good. Understand who made it and when it was created and, and how often is it updated and what the scale is and so on and so forth. So one of the things that we all love about the Living Atlas is that it is not only curated and interactive and has live feeds, but it's actually documented with, and all of you out there are saying, metadata, Joseph. Exactly. It's documented. It, it's not perfect, though, right? It has its data quality standards, but knowing that you can go into the metadata and say, okay, for example, census data, wonderful data set, but you all know and we know that there are certain segments of the population that are more challenged in terms of being counted, okay, undercounted or overcounted. University students is a notorious uh, longstanding example. Do they, do they get counted where they live in the dorm or the apartment where they're going to school or are they counted at home? Well, they're actually counted in the former, but do their parents count them? 
So there are measures to protect that kind of data integrity, and all of that metadata is actually put into the Living Atlas. So you'll see a lot of good documentation, as I'll explain here in a moment. But this is a page that uh, you can use to, to get a sense of where the data comes from. Now, I'd like to start with a couple of apps. I think that's a great way of st getting started with the Living Atlas. Some of these apps are pulling data from the Living Atlas, and they're incredibly powerful. They can be used in 5, 10, 15 minutes in class. And I'm just going to highlight two of them. Uh, my colleagues are probably knowing, Joseph, don't get too into this because you, you'll never stop. But uh, one of them is the Wayback imagery. And so if I view the application just here from the apps page of the Living Atlas, this is, oh my gosh, when this came out two years ago, many of us were saying, this is incredible. So you've got five years worth of imagery. I'm going to check the box. This is an application, a web mapping application. I'm going to check the box to the left of that. And then as I, as I view the little tiles, notice the changes in the landscape. So I can talk about urban growth in this case. You probably know this is Las Vegas. So I've got five years worth of imagery. But what if I'm teaching a different topic? What if I zoom out and I have, I have my students think about, you know, what are the challenges of having a big city out in the, in the desert? So if I scroll over here, I'm looking at, okay, I'm going to take a look at, as many of you know, this is Lake Mead. And if I scroll down to this 2014 layer, ah, I can look at, oh my goodness, I can see the changes from 2014 to 2019 in Lake Mead. So the point is, as I do that, you're seeing, uh-oh, what's wrong with this picture? The lake is actually going down in, in the level. So, okay, that fits into my, my discussion with the students. So you can zoom to your school. What buildings have been constructed in on your school grounds or in your neighborhood over the last five years? You can look at coastal erosion in England, the Three Gorges Dam, Saudi Arabia in the, the center pivot irrigation out in the middle of the desert. Okay, Joseph, enough, I get it. So, but the point is you've got five years worth of imagery and notice one last thing here. You can also, in the upper left here, choose layers to put into your ArcGIS Online web maps. You can take them out of the app and use them and add landscape, population, et cetera. So that's just one of the Living Atlas apps. It's called the Wayback uh, app, okay? So I'm gonna turn off that uh, tab. I'm gonna show you one more. This taps into what we were talking about earlier, and that is the Internet of Things. You've got these live feeds from sensors increasingly tied to locations on the planet. So if I'm teaching about seasonal change, Southern Hemisphere versus Northern Hemisphere, or precipitation, deserts versus rainforests versus taiga versus chaparral, I can say, oh, well, right here in southern Algeria, for example, here's the rainfall. There are certain months with absolutely no rainfall at all. Now, where is this data coming from? Again, there's metadata, but it's, it's, it's an interpolated surface from soil, precipitation, and other sensors that are spaced irregularly on the ground and also from ocean buoys. But if I take a look at that versus, hmm, what about the Pacific Northwest up in the U.S.? I've got a very seasonal sort of change each year. And is it increasing over time or decreasing? So this alone with the Water Balance app, you've got about, uh, what is it, six variables tied to the Internet of Things inside an app ready to go in five minutes, right? Or actually in 30 seconds, I pulled it up, right? So that's just one of the apps from the Living Atlas. So that's Living Atlas apps, okay? And as a broader discussion, these are coming from this series of environmental feeds. So there's a feeds page that we'll also have on the resource that uh, gets into these as well as wildfire perimeters and floods and, of course, uh, current health challenges that we face right now. All of those are live feeds, okay? Now, let's, let's talk about how do you get into the Living Atlas. I would start, if I were you, with livingatlas.arcgis.com. And there are a couple ways to actually browse the content in there. The way I do it, you can scroll down and go to browse content and look at maps, ooh, layers, scenes, etc. But I like to go into the very top ribbon there and just go to browse. Okay, just go to browse, and in that browse tab, you will see the different categories of content. You can also, of course, as you can see here, search in the ribbon for the content that you want. So if I search, for example, inside here, I'm going to search for, how about political? Okay, and notice in the upper right, the results. Now, as, as you have 
discovered in these mapping hours, there's no shortage of data, living atlas or otherwise. So your, your challenge as an educator is always, how do I filter down? You know, filtering was a concept over in ArcGIS Online where we filtered and got rid of some data. Here, filtering also applies because it's, it's kind of like the general filtering you do on the web. You have various tools in search, for example, to narrow down your content. Same thing here in the Living Atlas. Right now, I've got 61 results. Now, remember Kylie talked about this a couple uh, days ago, and that is if you, if you click here, ESRI only content, not that it's perfect, but if I want to narrow down to certain authors, it could be a person that you know on, on ArcGIS Online that's producing content, it could be an organization, could be NOAA, could be WHO, ESRI, etc. Now if I filter that, notice in political still up on the top, but now I've got 21 results. And notice here I've got this charted territory maps, a little bit of metadata here. Ooh, this sounds intriguing. A, a, a detailed vector tile base map, more about that in later episodes, what's vector tile, but featuring a geopolitical style reminiscent of a printed atlas plate or a school classroom wall map that many of us remember pulling down from the wall. Ooh, and notice here that I've checked on favorite. Now, what does that mean? We haven't paid too much attention to that, but favorites actually are, are quite a handy thing inside ArcGIS Online because it allows you to pull up a set of content that you can just quickly pull up at any time once you're logged into your organizational account. And I am, notice up in the upper right here, I can use this portal without being logged in, but if I wanna favorite it, it's gonna say, hey Joseph, where, where, where am I gonna put that favorite? You have to be signed in to be able to save the favorite. So inside my content zone, uh, in this tab, I'm inside my ArcGIS Online organization. And if I go to my favorites, oh, the charted territory map is there. So that's just a nice way of being able to save some of these things that you search for and find inside ArcGIS Online. And we're not gonna spend time going into that, but it is a very nice map that has political boundaries and some data attached to it. So let's move on for a moment. Another set that we'd like you to think about is a beautiful set of um, ecophysiographic maps, and this touches on a little bit of the metadata, so I wanted to, to pay attention to it right now. I'm gonna search on ecophysiographic, kind of a big word there, but it encompasses, as the name implies, lots of different rich things. And it also touches on something we don't often talk about in GIS land, and that is beautiful maps, right? Many of us were attracted to this because we love maps, and, and indeed, for many years, some of the maps, admittedly, from GIS were, were frankly a, a bit ugly. but Nowadays, there's some beautiful maps that really attract attention and good content in them. Now, if I do a search on ecophysiographic, here's the metadata. It encompasses four different things, bioclimates, landforms, mesas, buttes, etc., lithology, so the subsurface and land cover, how the land is actually used, ag, pasture, urban, etc., okay? So if I open that one up in the map viewer, before I do that, notice here that there's some nice metadata that talks about what the different lithology and the, and the, the bioclimates and so on. It also says here that because it's an image service, it can't be symbolized and displayed well as a in the, in the legend. I'll illustrate that here. So if I go into that actual map, notice on the left side here, this legend is really not very useful. So in the metadata, it says, hey, this is a map. It's, there's nothing wrong with it, but to really use it in the context of research and teaching, you need to go into this layer, and that has, it's the same content, but notice now on the left side, it has, okay, Arctic Mountains on acidic plutonics with bare area. So I've got, a, again, this, I think this is, this is beautiful stuff. Let, just allow me to have a moment. Okay, I'm done now. But the point is, these are beautiful maps. They are rich in content, rich in metadata. And let's uh, do a couple last things before I close out here, and that is, let's look at population. My colleagues are gonna get into this a bit more, but one of the things that you can do in working with GIS is you can go to these government portals, Census, USGS, and you can get data from there. And it's admittedly a bit clunky, depending on the portal. Some of them are easy to use, some of them are a bit more difficult. I would start, rather than going to each individual government agency in their portal, I would start with the Living Atlas. So for example, you can go to census.gov and eventually, at some point, you're gonna be able to get polygons and you're gonna be able to get demographic information and you're gonna need, do, you're gonna need to do a little bit of GIS-y stuff to join those things together. But here, inside the Living Atlas, 
the American Community Survey data is in there. So what does that mean, Joseph? Why should I care? Well, because if you, again, quickly want a map that has some of these community survey, monthly survey, demographic, housing, et cetera, variables, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up just one of these in here. Oh, wow, look at this incredible, you folks, uh, look what's in here. Little bit of metadata here. If you wanna get into what more metadata is available, then you, of course, click on each individual layer. I'm gonna show you just one of them. Oh my goodness, internet connectivity from the American Community Survey. Um, we're gonna get into this in future mapping hours, but we've got two variables. Actually, Kylie hinted a, a, about this in a, in a couple of episodes ago. How do you map two variables? The color is percentage of households with no internet access and the, and the size, so we're mapping two things in one map, really exciting stuff. The number, so if you're actually just kind of coming back to the basics, trying to get your students to understand percentages versus raw numbers, stuff like this I think is wonderful to be able to drive that concept home. And as many layers are, it is scalable. So if you zoom in, you're gonna get more content at different levels of census geography. So state, county, zip code oftentimes, congressional district, census tract, block group. So I'm looking at patterns. I'm trying to pick out urban versus rural patterns, relationships, and trends. There's a lot of points here. That's why it's taking a little while to draw. But you can see the, the differences between over where Tom is, for example, Kansas City. I'm seeing over on the east end of this map. Okay, generally lower percentage with no internet access. That makes sense given what I know about bandwidth and, and providers and so on and so forth. But being able to have this at your fingertips, really powerful. Okay, my colleagues will get into this a little bit more. Let me just mention one thing here at the end. My colleague over in training and I developed this Living Atlas of the World course. Now we're gonna talk about other ways to learn more about this, but this particular course is actually aimed at educators. And as you can see here, it uh, does require a few hours to, to go all the way through if you truly wanted to. You can just dip a toe into the, into the intro part if you want to. But here are the goals to enable you to basically do what I did in the last 10 minutes. And that is get into the Living Atlas, use it, and also to do some of the things that my colleagues will talk about here in uh, the next few moments. And that is how do I use it inside RTIS Online? So that's all you need is an RTIS Online organizational subscription. It's all in online and that's called the teaching with the living atlas of the world and it's part of our training platform that i think charlie will talk about more later all right folks thanks that was great joseph so what's really cool there is we got to see all this data that's available as well as one of our first resources for learning more about these things right the training site so i'm going to jump in and share my screen now and we're going to look at some similar but a little bit different concepts so now that we've got the browser up, what we can see is the Learn ArcGIS site. Now what Joseph was just showing was on the training site. And he was talking about how there's this course and they've developed it and you can go through it. And one of the really neat things about the training site is you can track your own progress. You can watch what things, there's some paths and plans that you can go through to take structured approaches to learning the material. There's another site though. One thing with the training site is you are logged in. You need access to that site. That's part of your account. And it's something that's enabled as part of your account. But what if that's not enabled for you? What if you want something a little bit lighter weight? What if you wanna start learning, but you're not sure you wanna invest that four hours in a formal course? Well, learn.arcgis.com is a great place to go. So what this has is a bunch of lessons about different geographic topics and different GIS concepts based on real world problems. You kinda of get to put a pretend hat on and try out a real problem. In here, you don't need to log in. Now, as part of this uh, episode series, you can get a login, and there are some of these lessons that you will actually need a login, but you can get one from them. It's all based on temporary ones. Um, it's a little bit lighter weight of an option than the training site. That said, let's look at what we have here. You can see that what's new on the site, but I'm going to jump right in to the lesson gallery. What that is is going to show all of the content in the site and a really intuitive search interface for it. For example, let me clear my filter because I was looking at this earlier. Here's all of the content. You can see just tons of lessons about different topics, different applications, different products that Esri offers. Now, I know Joseph just did a really cool session on Living Atlas of the World, and I'm ready to learn a little bit more about that. So I can come in here and filter by product. All right, there's Living Atlas of the World because that's what I'm interested in learning about today. You can see four different lessons, and in particular, because I'm new to this, 
getting started with. Well, that's probably a great hit. Now, Joseph pointed out the training class. It was about four hours, right? That's a significant time to invest, and that's worth it once you know that you want to learn that topic. But I'm not quite sure yet, right? It looked cool when Joseph showed it, but I want to do it. I want to see if it's right for me, and this is a great way to get started. It's only 45 minutes. So we can jump in, and in the lesson, you can see who wrote it, and Lisa Berry, you'll see her name in a number of blogs and other places, is a great trusted Esri resource. And you can see it's about mapping and education. Okay, cool, you can see kind of the requirements, and as we mentioned, this one will end up needing a login. That's okay, I've got one. I requested my free login for the mapping hour. I can scroll down, I can see a little bit about what I'm gonna learn. Okay, I'm gonna explore the website. I think that's probably what Joseph kind of did. And oh, using it in online, even using it in pro. Great, I know exactly what I'm gonna get and how long each of those things is gonna take to do. So I'm gonna go ahead and scroll down. And since Joseph already showed this section, let's go ahead and jump right to using it in ArcGIS Online. One thing I wanna show you while you're here is this contents button. These are very long pages, but if you click contents, you can kind of see the whole structure and jump right to the area you need. So even though I could see at that top level that I could explore, I could use an online or I could use in pro, now I can also see the subtopics there. And that's gonna really help me navigate to what I want to learn about. All right, so in here, I'm gonna go ahead and open my account as well. And to do that, I tend to use a separate tab or browser window. The reason I do that is one of the cool things I can do is set it up so that I can do them side by side. So now, as I'm scrolling and seeing my steps, okay, go to ArcGIS Online, sign in. Up, oh, I've done that. All right, I'm gonna click the Map tab. Let's go ahead and do it. As you can see, I can follow the steps. I can read through them while also working. Now, if you have multiple monitors or a big enough screen, you can do it side by side like this, which is great. If I needed to, I could also print this lesson and have it next to me and be checking off the steps as I go. So in this case, I don't actually need the lesson open and to let you better see what I'm doing, I'm gonna go ahead and minimize that and jump this to full screen. All right, we're looking at the map. Now, can anyone guess what base map I'm probably gonna use here? All right, I know, I really do like that light gray one. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch to it. But something you may not have known that I wanna just throw in here, where do these base maps come from? Now your organization can change the choices you have but the default set that most organizations keep using actually come from the Living Atlas. So if you didn't know it, there's another thing. You're already using content that's in the Living Atlas. So what Joseph showed was using the website and finding information that you want that you could then bring into your own maps. But say I'm already working on a project and I have some data in a map and I just want to enhance it a bit. Well, I can actually look at my Living Atlas content right here. And to do that, just like we've done with other layers, we're gonna go to add and look at that. We can choose Living Atlas layers. So instead of just a search or adding from a certain, we can go right to the Living Atlas layers themselves. And in here, you'll get this dialogue. Now, Joseph also showed you how you could filter some content. And there are over 4,500 layers here. So that's a bit to browse through, especially in this narrow of a dialogue showing one, one card width at a time, right? I'm gonna go ahead and filter. That is this button here. It's gonna let me have some choices. Now again, I can see a whole bunch of content and maybe I know the topic I want with maybe environmental data. So I'm lowering the number of choices here. I've got it under a thousand now, but there's also a really cool option here because one of the things with the GIS is that there's location that matters. Now, if I know I'm working in the US, I don't care if they have a great data set for Germany because that doesn't help me, right? So what I'm gonna do is check on this box at the top, only show content within map area. So that means since my map over here right now is looking at the United States or focused on that area, it has some Canada, some Mexico, that's fine. I'm at least gonna limit the data I'm seeing to those areas. And look, it's cut it by another half. So we've got a much better set here, and now I can go ahead and search, and I might have a better time finding some land cover data that I'd like to bring into my map. All right, we've got our land cover data, and I am gonna go ahead and look. Let's see, what do I wanna do? All right, well in this case, I'm not seeing quite the one I want here, so I do need to refine my search a little bit more. 
And I'm going to add a term, and I'll explain it in a minute. NLCD. Now, when we hit enter for that, look at it. We're getting much better results here. And I can go ahead and take that land cover data and add it to the map. Like we've done before, there's an add button. But first, let's make sure I've got what I want. As Joseph said, the stuff in the Living Atlas has some great metadata. So let's take advantage of it. And we can learn about it. And now you can see what that NLCD means, National Land Cover Database. OK, that gives me a little bit more confidence in this data because I know it was made by an authoritative source. There's some things right here that also help us know that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what these little icons at the bottom of this card mean. So this first one says it's authoritative. It's recommended by Esri. So that means Esri has taken the provider of this data and knows that you can trust them and given it kind of a seal of approval, right? The next one you get here is that it's in the Living Atlas. And what that means is it's Esri has curated it. These things don't automatically appear in a Living Atlas. There are people who evaluate every one of the submissions and make sure it meets the standards that we want the Living Atlas to have. And this last one here shows that this is for subscribers. So it's kind of that middle level that Joseph was talking about, right? You do need to be logged in to use it, but it's not the premium content. It's not going to use credits. Great. So I'm going to go ahead and add this to my map. And I can choose either the plus button there or the one down here to get that added. Now, once we're getting this added, I'm going to go ahead and close these dialogues to really focus in on my map. Let's whoop a little bit too far there. So let's zoom in. All right, so we can see our area. And as Joseph did, I'm going to focus on a specific area. But before I do that, Tom showed you something in a previous episode about time. And you may remember that you got a slider at the bottom. Well, this looks exactly the same, which tells me this is actually time based data. Now, if I'd really spent some time in the metadata, I would have found out the same thing there. But it's another way to know what you're actually working with. And in this case, like Joseph did, let's go ahead and look at Las Vegas. All right, well, there's a lot of colors here and I'm gonna go over to my content or my legend. Now, remember, I can see the legend here in a focused view. I could also see it by taking that layer and saying, show me the legend right here where we are. And around Vegas, there's a lot of red that I'm looking at. So I can look over here and see, oh, okay, it's developed areas. That's great. Well, kind of want to focus on those developed areas. And let's see, maybe I can click through here. And as Tom showed me, I can kind of step through some of the time and I can see the changing, right? Moving it over one at a time. I'm going to jump back a little bit and look at some of these times here. When we know, watch that area around Vegas. Here's our developed areas. And now here we are. Wow. There was a lot of development in that 2004 to 2005 time. All right, so I've seen a little bit about this developed areas, but I really want to focus on it. So there's something you can do with these layers, even though they're not my layer, I can change how it looks, right? We've seen that before. That's not a new concept. In the Living Atlas data, there's something really curious, though. This is imagery. Right? It's not individual items I've added to the map. It kind of has that, that coverage like Joseph was talking about. It, it, fills that whole, it fills that whole area we're looking at. Right, I don't just see a couple red points. I'm seeing it everywhere just spread out as it really would be. So in this case, instead of changing just one symbol that represents something, I'm going to actually work on this whole image display. Wow. This is pretty interesting. I can see all the symbology they've used, what it means. Okay, and I can choose a renderer. Now, something that's really interesting here is a renderer is kind of like a bunch of stuff done for us to make the map really look good. And in this case, there's some made just for this layer. And if you expand that, you can see I have some choices. There's a user-defined one with some just different bands. There's a cartographic one. Okay, it's a default. Well, I'm really curious right now about developed areas. And look, I have a developed renderer. I have a forest render. I can focus on those things in this data that I'm curious about. So I'm going to go ahead and choose the developed renderer. And I'm going to click apply just so you can see what that's already done to my map. All right. Now we're really seeing our developed areas. The other areas may be important. This is when the project I'm going to do really comes into play. If, but right now, I want to look at urbanization. 
And to do that, I care about what's developed. So let's focus in. Now, you remember in our legend, we saw that there were the reds, right? Now my eye has a hard time sometimes distinguishing these different reds. Now that I have simplified it and just focused on our developed areas, I can go ahead and also pick a color ramp that will help me see this, the areas that I'm interested in. In particular, let's go ahead and check cyan to purple. All right, so really developed is gonna be purples and we're gonna fade down to blues. When it's developed, but a little bit, you know, more open space. Let's go ahead and apply that. Wow. So now, when it was red, I didn't really have a sense of where might the strip be? Where is that core downtown area? And in this, the data is just starting to yell at me, right? Like, look, I'm purple right here. This is where I'm the most urbanized. This is where there's the most development that has happened. So we're going to go ahead and close that out. And we're going to go ahead and look now at another layer. So that was an imagery layer from the Living Atlas, and you can see how you can get some imagery that's gonna show you some stuff on the map, and here we looked at that urbanization. But there may be more things I wanna put into this same map, and in this case, there is. So I'm gonna add another type of layer. We're gonna go back to that add, and we're gonna use the Living Atlas again, and now I'm gonna do a search for USA counties. Because something with development, sometimes I wanna see the change in different counties and how those counties are looking. All right, I found one, and I'm just gonna go ahead and add that onto my map. Uh-oh, where'd my other data go? All right, so there's a couple things to be aware of. If we go back to the details, you can see my new layer was added on top. One way you could do this is change the order. I can grab it and drag it. But you know what, that's not working. So what else might I do? Remember, even though it's a living atlas layer, I can change the symbology or the style. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. We can go to the options, and in particular, what I wanna do is change that symbol. So I click on the symbol side, and I can look at it. Now, for the fill, since I just wanna see where the counties are, I don't really want them filled in at all. I'm gonna go ahead and pick no color for that fill. All right, that's getting better. Now, that kind of orangey line doesn't work for me, so I'm gonna go jump back in that dialog, and I can also change that outline. So I'm gonna go ahead and pick a gray. I'm gonna give it some transparency. Say okay. All right, now we're getting some boundaries that are gonna work for us a lot better. Let's jump back to, oops. You know what, I made a very common mistake. I set it up, but I forgot to say okay. So let's go ahead and we'll quickly do that again. We're gonna get rid of the fill color. We're gonna take the outline, make it gray, We'll give it some transparency. We see it on the map, but we haven't actually set that yet. This is kind of like a preview of it. So I need to make sure I click OK down here at the bottom to really get that into my map. Then I can click Done and get back to my layers. All right, now you can see we have our boundaries. We can see more information about these counties and what is where. Zoom out a little bit so we can see more of them. And you can see the urban areas and wow, if we take the same data we were looking at and bring it out here, we can really start to see what areas are developed across the US. You can see, here's Tom's area, Kansas City, Joseph was talking about, you can definitely see a cluster there. Over here near where Charlie is, got some clusters there. A little bit here around Joseph as well, and of course I'm near LA, so we definitely know that's gonna have some purple. So it's really interesting how you can add just Living Atlas data. We're learning more about the US, we're learning more about our world, and we're able to make it look in a way that communicates to us the things that we're interested in. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Tom. Thanks, Kylie, that was, that was cool. I sent, uh, I sent Charlie an email a while back and uh, was asking him for some, some help doing something very similar to what you just did. So I'm, I'm hoping he can step in and, and show us. Yeah. Something. You were talking about uh, that you wanted to have a, uh, an outline map and maybe some population in it. So let me see if I can uh, open up my screen, share this, and let me get my, this is the mapping hour hub that is part of the K-12 organization. All right, so I'm, I'm logged in here, and I watched a woman do this activity with Living Atlas data. So 
I think this might solve your problem. First of all, do you want like the whole the whole U.S.? Is that what you're looking for? I, you know, I'm in Kansas City. I'm really looking for Kansas. And well, well, Kansas City, which? Well, Kansas- true. In this case, I want the state of Kansas though, and the state of Missouri so that I get both sides of Kansas City. Oh, okay. So you need a little data. All right. So we can go in and add... And I can go browse the Living Atlas layers, 4,500 layers. All right, we don't have that much time, so let's do what I've seen. Let's see, that was uh, show only the content that's in the map area. And I think I'm actually going to see if I can just reduce the number of uh, data layers even further. I'm gonna go to just the US items. All right, now I'm gonna spill that back up. And um, let me think, I'm looking for boundaries. I'm looking for an administrative boundary. And I think I, you mentioned counties, right? Counties and state boundaries, if we've got it. Counties and states. All right. So let's see. Counties and counties generalized. Counties and counties generalized. Let's go for the more specific one, since you're going to be focused in down close. This is a little slower to draw than the generalized one, but it's still pretty good. And uh, then you wanted states. Yeah, just to help clarify the boundary, because, you know, the Kansas-Missouri state line runs right through our city. Right, th- right through the city. The state line runs right through the city. And uh, where do you reside? I reside on the Missouri side, but I work on the Kansas side. Ooh, so, well, okay. All right, so one of them is generalized, and one of them is is more, I, I'm guessing this is more... Uh, refined, higher level uh, uh, accuracy. Let's see. Is that what I'm seeing here? Okay. I could read that description. I think I'm going to go with that one. All right. Go ahead and close this. And now, I'm, first, I'm, I'm just going to save this map here. So we've got a map that we can go so that I can share this with you because I'm in your organization. I'll be able to share this with you. Uh, This is the Kansas and Missouri map. Uh, I'll add uh, Kansas as a tag and add Missouri as a tag. And I'm just going to copy that and paste it in here so that I can save that. So now we can come back to that if we need it. All right. So in my contents, I've got the state boundaries. And I saw this one where uh, uh, Kylie went in and said, show me with the location only the symbols, these yellow symbols. I'm going to make it just be outlines. All right. So I could probably make this entirely transparent. I could do it that way. I wonder if that works. Well, what's the difference between doing it entirely transparent? Oh, I see. So this says no fill, no nothing at all. All right. Let's let's go ahead and do that. I think I've got a, it looks like a, oh, wait a minute. That's the fill. So I got to make sure I'm in the outline. All right. Go for a, uh, you know, I don't, I, w- I don't want this to change on me. I want to have a, a nice visible outline all the time. Okay. So you want to just, all right, I'm going to save that. So we've got our changes here. Uh, you wanted just the two count, the two, the two states, Missouri and Kansas, right? That's it. If you can do it. All right. Well, 
I can just zoom you down, but do you want just, that, just, that like, just, that seems like cheating. Really? Okay. I don't want any of that I other can, stuff. I can, I can get, I can widerize this. <laughs> uh, no, huh? Okay. All right. Counties. Uh, I've got a filter here. So this filter. Wow. Age. Hey, what's all the stuff that is in here? If I click on one of these counties, I'm seeing that there's only one, two, three, four, five pieces of data here. But if I go in and look in the filter, it's got more than five. It's got to do to do to do. It's got a whole bunch of stuff. Ah, there's state name. So please, computer only include those counties where state name is state name is what are my options here if i go to unique ah that's going to give me a uh, let me see a uh, hijk kansas kansas go ahead and apply i got it oh no wait you wanted missouri Right, so I'm just going to say uh, state name is Missouri, Missouri. You want them both? Ideally, we'd get them both. Hmm. <laughs> I could get some tape on here and put them together. Well, okay. Uh, all right. I'm going to edit this filter and say, I, th I think if I add another expression, I, I, I've got to do this again. Uh, state name, state, state name is, uh, I've got Missouri there, state name H-I-J-K, Kansas. All right. Wait a minute. What did I do? I'm going to phone a friend here. What did I do here? Uh, oh, oh, okay. I'm seeing, I'm seeing signals here. So uh, I, I got to do something with the filter here. I think that was uh, no, this is, that's the wrong one. That's the state one. I got to do something with the. Come on, Charlie. You can, you can hit the right one here. All of these expressions must be true. Well, how could a state be both Missouri and Kansas? I can't do that. Edit this. Do I add something else here? Say only pay attention to one. These red X's. Looks like these are going to delete that expression. I want that. I want that one. Ooh, here we go. Display features in the layer that match any of the following expressions. Okay. Apply. Great. Ah, ah. Cool. Except, wait a second, you wanted these to be like hollow? To see something that's in here? Well, ultimately, I think we're going to show population density, I hope. Okay. So mm -hmm. let me see. Did these have, what did these have in here? They have population per square mile. So let's see what I've got. Uh, there's the total population. And uh, so working, working. Oh, that's just going to give me, it looks like I want counts and um, counts and amounts color, I think. So I want, oh, you know what I did? I went for the state bound. Ah, oh, geez. Do you do it on the wrong layer? I got it. I did it on the wrong layer here. Location, don't want location. I want LMNO population. Oh, did you want population density? Pop per square that, mile. Yeah. Pop per square mile. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah. All right. Bang. Awesome. Oh, wait a minute. Do you want, do you need, do you need a uh, a larger uh, definition on these uh, borders here? Uh, you tell you me. Need your, well, it's like 
I could give you a stronger outline here and uh, don't uh, adjust it automatically. Give it, give it a nice substantial one. It's half a, half a pixel right here. Let's go for one pixel. So now, except now I can't really tell necessarily where the, where the edge of the state is. And, and uh, so maybe let's go back into the state borders and bigorize these symbols so that uh, they're bigger. No, that's the fill. Don't go for the fill, go for the outline, go for the size. If I go for a two, well, let me just make it so there's no doubt here. Ooh, I like that. All right, what are you gonna do with this? Well, I was hoping to print it, actually. We were gonna put it up on the wall for the kids to see, so they always have a reference. Well, okay, yeah. so I can, I can print the map. Do you need a legend? Legend would be helpful. All right. Working, working, working. You could take this because I assume that it's going to make this uh, that picture that we had show up, and it would end up looking just like what we've got here. Um, you're, it's not going to. It's not going to. If I zoom in into the Kansas City area, it's not going to make it any bigger. It's just going to mm -hmm. because all you got was counties. That's okay for you though. That'll work. All right. Well, all right, I, then I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I get this centered just right. And I'm going to save this. And uh, you can come back in. Now that you've seen me, you can come back in and make modifications just that, like that'll work. Yeah, would you save that? Uh, rather share that for me to the mapping oh, hour? Oh, share that. Okay, you're in, let me see. Share it with the mapping hour group? Yeah. Okay. So just the group. So nobody outside of the our our organization will be able to see that. Or do you want it to be shared with everyone as well? It can be shared with everybody. Okay, it'll be shared with everyone. So that means also everybody inside the organization can see it, but it's also shared with this group so that you can have access to it pretty easily. That's and great. then there's that neat little link that you can send to people. All right? That's perfect. All right. Well, my geo mentoring job is done. I've got a you map awesome. for you. You were awesome. I'm going to call you next time I have a technical issue. Okay. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks. Bye bye. Well, now let's get let's jump back here. That's a process that people can take advantage of. We've got a whole zone where people can go and say, hey, I hear there's a map out there of the schools that have access to our software bundle. And this is one of these things that we've said to people, yep, go in and see if your school has access to the software. And as you get zooming in down close, you'll see that there are people that are here and also, if you take a look at map number four, there are geo mentors who are in the region or they're people who can give you a hand if you get stuck. You can contact people, you can click on these dots and explore. You can read some cases of people that are going through and seeing what's up in here. But for now, what you've got is you know how to print a map, you know how to make a map, you know how to save it. And that's all going to be part of your mapping hour experience. So let me get back to our slides. See if I can do a little wrap up here. We've talked about the living atlas of the world. Great content, fabulous content. And generally speaking, that's going to be a zone where if you're doing a project like I was doing for Tom, you'll want to start there because that's authoritative data, it's good quality data, it's updated, you can rely on it. And as you're logged in, you can get access to it. If you're not logged in, you can still get access to a lot of that content that's there, not all of it. 
Then Joseph mentioned the Esri training site. And that's, you may see that up in the left-hand side, it's, it's essentially sort of Esri Academy. This is, this is the zone where people who are saying, I need to learn how to use the software. I need to learn just focusing on teach me how to work with the software. That's how to work with it. And in order to use the training site, in order to log in, you have to have what is called an Esri enabled or Esri access enabled login. Now your login can either have Esri access enabled or it may not be enabled. All the logins that uh, we're setting up for people who write us and ask us for a login in order to read the or watch the mapping our videos, those are all Esri access enabled. Um, if you look at yours when you say, hey, send me all of the logins. I'm, I'm at the troubleshooting page because I can't remember my login. Send me all the logins that are attached to my email. It may say, uh, this one has Esri Access enabled. That one does not have Esri Access enabled. If that's the case, you can contact your ArcGIS Online organization admin because in an organization, the default is that they're not enabled. So there are a lot of you out there that may find that you can't log in. And if that's the case, just check in with your administrator on that one. Joseph also showed you some uh, of the subscriber content and that there is some premium content there. You can explore the information that he presented uh, when you go in and, and take a look at the, at, at the uh, Living Atlas. And then Kylie brought you to the Learn site, learn.arcgs.com. Different uh, sort of scenario-based approaches to looking at content. Both the training site and the learn site, great places to, to, uh, to get guidance about how can you work with this content. So these concepts, the living atlas, I just love going in there and browsing. That's the place where if I've, if I've got a free 15 minutes, I'll sit down and go browse and see what's there because there's always some nook and cranny that I haven't looked at before that's just got such good stuff there. And finding things that I can, I can access even without being logged in or that require the premium, that's just a, a powerful set of content there. Then there are great places to get instruction. Remember that Esri Access Enabled, one of the advantages of going in and taking a course on the training site is that that's where you can build a training history. The training site will keep track because you've logged in and you've said, okay, I want to take this course and it'll keep track of where you are so that, hey, I didn't have time to finish the entire course right now. It'll know how far you've gotten and it will, if you come back in, it will drop you right there. And then thinking about projects and maps, projects with maps and apps using the living atlas of the world, using that content. Begin your project with content from the living atlas. These resources from this zone will take you there. There's the address to a, an interesting course that is on the training site that Joseph was walking you through. There's the address to the interesting 45 minute lesson that Kylie did just part two about. And there is a site looking at landscape layers that is coming from the Teach With GIS site. So Living Atlas, great content, learn, takes advantage of it a lot. Teach With takes advantage of it a lot. The K-12 org, takes advantage of that in some of the content that we've got there as well. Lots of good resources there. This is the magic of working with GIS. Good tools, good data, good projects in your mind. More to come. We're just getting started because tomorrow in the next episode, maybe even later today, if you're just doing binge watching 
these episodes, you'll get to see some really cool processes. That's it for today. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.